It is difficult to analyze or criticize a piece of work like The Last of Us Part Two. It is objectively a massive achievement in AAA video game design that brings the video game medium a level of legitimacy against more traditional forms of art like literature and film. Hundreds of people spent years of their lives sweating and sometimes even bleeding into making this experience just for us, all to serve this one vision of interactive storytelling. Yet, as the game reaches the top of what this generation of video games can do, it also shows the pitfalls of this AAA approach. The Last of Us Part Two is, in many ways, at war with itself. It achieves things that I have never experienced in a video game before, but it's so tied to that tonal story of hate and humanism that it actually punishes the player for doing anything that doesn't follow this strict arc. The core story, the reason any of us want to play this game, isn't served by being told in a video game. The story is more crafted for a multiple season prestige television show, which is such a shame since the world building, the characterization, the visceral combat and the art design are so vast and surprisingly interactive. The dissonance between what the game wants you to do and feel and what you can do and feel is so overwhelming at times that it undercuts the powerful motivation that I think brought us all to the table, the story of Ellie and Joel. It's disappointing because the pieces here are just so good that it makes me question if we really need to reconsider what AAA game development can and can't do. We could have killed you. <laughs> Maybe you should have. The Last of Us Part Two continues that post-apocalyptic story of Ellie and Joel years after their brutal confrontation with the Fireflies. Both are now established in the small town of Jackson, living within the community and setting up roots. Things happen that change that, conflict arises, and an older, more grizzled Ellie sets out on a quest for vengeance. This story is told through multiple perspectives and timelines, all attempting to paint a picture of what it means to live in this new reality, the impact of taking a life, and how that one action, even in this brave new world, ripples out and still creates chaos. In her quest, Ellie rides a horse, a car, a boat. She swims, she climbs, she solves difficult physics-based puzzles, and most importantly, she kills. Any game that looks to interrogate what it means to murder others but still forces you to kill as a basic form of interaction in the game is going to have some of that good old ludonarrative dissonance. This game, though, takes it a step further by elevating the brutality of Ellie's murders, yet showing the player her confusing sympathy with it in cutscenes. Early on in the game, during a scripted encounter, Ellie beats a woman to death with a steel pipe. Afterwards, she is visibly traumatized by this, and this trauma leads to more meaningful character interactions for everyone involved. But by that point during my gameplay experience, I had quite literally sliced open the larynxes of hundreds of crying men and women who begged me to stop as blood gurgled from their throats. I killed dogs with my bare hands as they whimpered in my arms. This was impactful to me, not because the dogs and random enemies now have names, which is a really trite way of moralizing, but because the violence and how you interact with the violence in the game was so visceral. As the player, we were already traumatized much earlier on, so when the scriptive narrative tries to tell us that Ellie now feels bad about this one murder, it takes you out of the experience, and worse, it makes so many of these story moments just feel inauthentic. This is one instance of something that happens again and again and again. 
The scripted narrative overall works very hard to pose the complicated question, who really are the bad guys? In this world lacking moral absolutism, those who unconditionally love are also those who unconditionally hate. The developers do this admirably though, through multiple character perspectives and timelines. They really do take some time to explain how these shades of gray are manifested in different sorts of people. Yet, once again, how you play as these characters tells us the answer to these questions very early on. All of them are bad guys. All of them have brutally murdered, now named, combatants and innocents because the game designers forced us to do so. This dissonance of infiltrating and interrogating these interesting questions of what death means is undermined once again by how we play the game. There are ways that could have been helped, allowing a non-violent option for players during combat, or at the very least, having the scripted narrative reflect the fact that I just opened the faces of a stadium full of people. This never happens, despite the fact that the combat is just so pitch perfect in its execution. Stealth combat is reactive and subtle. The tension of second to second choices, meaning life or death, never leaves you from the first encounter to your last. The combat is most fun and works best when you mix pure stealth avoidance with goading the enemies to your previous location. Momentum as a theme pervades everything you do and combat is no exception. The exhilaration you feel from sniping out two enemies and leading their scared friends to your hidden bomb pile while slitting the throats of those who watch in horror is pretty unmatched in any gaming experience I've had, save maybe watching those really incredible gifted speedrunners go on pitch perfect killing sprees in Dishonored. Every bullet in this game needs to find its place or you risk death. You constantly scrounge for supplies to craft more and more exotic forms of murder. Everything ultimately though, leaves your enemies in broken piles of meat that used to have faces. I talked about momentum earlier, and there really is an established pace that the game takes. This is an urgent mission you're on, and internally that makes a lot of sense. Why would Ellie stop and philosophize on the meaning of life in a broken down bookshop as the killer she's been chasing for weeks are trying to elude her? How this affects the world the game developers created though, and how you interact with it, brings back this dissonance. The environments, are a marvel. They have the breadth of massive open world games coupled with the density and focus of walking simulators. Every grassy broken down bodega has hidden loot or my favorite hidden stories that make things in the shining little world a bit more clear. Ellie has the ability to traverse like never before. She can swim, she can climb. Every set piece now has a sense of verticality and depth to it. What you see is always the top of the iceberg of where you can go. And my favorite moments in the game are when Ellie and her companions discover those stories and then want to discuss what it means for them in the world. It makes the player feel like our interactions are now authentic and it characterizes them more fully because we made the choices, we made the discoveries. But even this, a truly rewarding narrative experience is undermined by the core story and the momentum of it. I had to make a choice dozens of times. Do I follow a companion who is spewing important exposition, making me go one way, or miss out on some important narrative main story beats and explore more more of the world that you, the developer, put in front of me. That world is also more diverse than ever before. Learning about the two major factions newly introduced in the game and how they created this hellscape along with personal stories of heroism and hate that you discover reinforces those themes of subjective humanism in many ways a lot better than the main narrative, but I get the sense the game doesn't want me to cherish these moments and instead wants me to shuffle along so I can put the controller down and watch these admittedly breathtakingly well-acted cutscenes. I want to experience the story that I created. Now, not all of the incidental writing is award-winning. There are certain characters in particular that shoot off quips more suited for Big Bang Theory than The Road. It does feel like some of the dialogue is just 
tonally completely confusing. It might have been ripped from an Uncharted game, but really doesn't have a place in The Last of Us. The game is also very, very long and doesn't give you the crunches that many players are used to. Things like maps, HUD design, collectible finders are nowhere to be seen, even though this world is vast and really full of treasures. Everything that I've talked about, all of these disparate pieces of game stand alone as world-class achievements in game design. The narrative pushed by the cutscenes could be its own HBO show. The combat encounters could and should be their own full-fledged multiplayer game, and the world-building mechanics and exploration is better than many big-budget open-world titles. Unfortunately, not only do these pieces don't fit together, but hurt the story, which should be the tool that is used to tie everything together in one perfect bow. That's why this is so disappointing, especially considering the allegations of crunch and a culture of perfection at Naughty Dog. Workers did that here. The Last of Us Part Two has some of the most perfect, quote unquote, design elements of any game I've experienced, but it just doesn't seem to work like it should for this story. The original Last of Us was so close to perfection because everything was meant to serve the narrative, a powerful, compelling narrative of love and despair. The Last of Us Part Two has the same powerful narrative about love and what it means to take a life, but now the gaming landscape is a lot different. AAA games are now expected to do everything exceedingly well for every type of player, and sometimes that just doesn't work as a whole. Despite how incredibly powerful this story ends, it should have been even more so if all of these pieces could come together. It really does deserve better.